All right, hello, Renegades. We are here in our interview series. We are catching up with the one, the only, not PC Teddy the second, not TC Petty the first. We're catching up with TC Petty the third. Because that's right. The man's so nice, they named him Trice. There you go, right? <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Oh, this is awesome. So our paths cross yet again. You're, you're not a Pennsylvanian anymore, but that's okay. No, nope. nope. I'm an expatriate. You I'm are. I'm now in North Carolina and living it up. So You are. You get to go to the barbecue. You get to do really cool things now. It's... For sure. It's just not fair. I mean, North Carolina is a pretty cool place. I have two different types of barbecue sauce that I have to contend with. It's mm. great. Yeah, do you like well? Do you like the vinegar or do you not? It's like well, it doesn't matter. I can go either way, east or west. <laughs> I'm good. I'm right in the middle. There you go. Fine. You can't beat that. It's it's the best of both worlds, right? That's right. Awesome. So welcome to the show. We're, we're doing a series of interviews to kind of get to know people around the convention. So if you'd like to bump into somebody, what are some questions you would ask? So we're kind of asking along the lines of, of the every person today. So thanks for taking a little time and uh, hanging out in the Renegade booth, as it were. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, this is, it looks great around here. Uh, have you got a nice drum set in the background? It's great. Awesome. Awesome. We could we maybe we could jam out. I mean, oh, it's not a rock band set. See, I'm a rock band guy. <laughs> Sorry. So. Uh, no, hey, I could set it up to do it. Look, all electronic. It's great. Awesome. Awesome. So, I well, maybe we could do that later, you know. I could, <laughs> I could throw well, down. Right in the booth. Right in the booth. It's perfect. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> Well, you know, we there might be some need to do that, but it's okay. But I thought, you know, it, we, we'd give you a chance because, you know, at previous conventions, we haven't felt comfortable, like, letting you loose on the floor. Um, but yeah, I think we're kind of, yeah, we're going to let you out of the, out on the floor and let you kind of, kind of chat it up today a little bit, if that's okay with you. That's all right. I've never been the face <laughs> of Renegade, but I've been behind the scenes working you know for what? years now. It's uh, it's surprising because I kind of remember when you first started with Renegade, but then uh, I asked today for, you know, a list of games that you've worked on, and uh, I had to make two columns. It's been a lot of stuff that you've helped develop, and yeah, I was, so I mean, Renegade's done a lot of stuff over the last two and a half years, so it's like they've kept me busy developing. So it's absolutely. Awesome. So now. You wear two shirts because you wear both a designer shirt and you wear a developer shirt. So, That's true. you know, we've talked to designers and I kind of get that process. But what what really makes the development process different from the design process? Well, I get to make the designers unhappy. Sure. That's the first part. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they love me by the end, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but no. So the difference between like when a designer comes with an idea to, you know, Scott or anybody at Renegade, uh, maybe it'll make it up the chain and they'll get a chance to put out a game. And uh, a lot of times I'll get a chance to look at that. And the difference is I'm going to be looking at things to just take your game and make it better. Okay. Right. So a lot of times a designer is con concerned with making a game that they, they love. Right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you just don't get as many blind play tests or outside feedback that you might want. And with me, you know, as so I can set up play tests, I can put it in front of people who have never played the game before. I've never played the game before sure. and it has to work. Okay. Right. And uh, I think the biggest difference, right, is, I'm just looking to tweak and make those good changes that get it ready so that we can put it in a box and put it out there. Whereas you're trying to actually make the game from the ground floor all the way up. And at the at the end, man, it is really tough to take it across the finish line. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to have that support, I think. Now, is it also one of those things where when you're, you're working on the game, um, you're kind of just so so neck deep into it. it. It may have been a project for for months, if not years, by the designer. And sometimes you can't smell the manure when you've been in the barn so long, right? You just it, it's just the way it is. So do you kind of feel like having a fresh set of eyes on something can really help, you know, polish it up a little bit? I think I think that's a nice way of putting it, right? You know, a nice way of putting it is manure. Uh, but like, <laughs> no, the, the nice way of putting it is is that like, you just get, I don't know. Even if you love your game, you still do get 
immune to some of the criticisms. Right. So it's really good. I, I mean, as a designer, mm-hmm. I really like it when someone presents ideas, even if I can shoot it down, even if I have final say. I just, I love it whenever I get ideas because uh, they can spawn some really cool, interesting things, and especially like like this at the end of the process it's it's a long road so mm-hmm. now you can just be like finally i i'm i may actually get a check for what i did and you can just put it out in the world and with with renegade it's good because like renegade is always very uh, very specific about like the process right it'll go through multiple people's hands and will eventually come out and sit on that shelf and uh, a designer that gets involved in that process doesn't necessarily have to be in every aspect of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's cool when a designer wants to at least, you know, be informed and stuff. It's, it's just a really neat process. So do you think that a lot of designers, like especially new ones, like look, we could be honest and say like a J. Alex Covert understands and is very comfortable with the process at this point, putting out as many games as he has. Oh, well, I mean, I could tell you stories, but, but <laughs> for sure, yeah. Yes, yes, we'll just assume. Okay. Um, but it's it's got to be like when they first come in and they start to work with a developer, do you think it's sometimes hard to let them understand, like, I'm not redesigning your game. We're just moving the pieces around. Is that a hard conversation to work through? Uh, it it really it's going to be each each individual is their okay. their own little the angel. Um, <laughs> I forget what the phrase is, but yeah, but everybody's going to be slightly different, right? Mm-hmm. But in the end, you know, it's like it's you know I, we we've so far never had to pull the card where you say that's just how it's going to be um, because most people are if you come to them with an idea that is solid sound actually makes the game better and they get to see it eventually people come around you know it's like it's not always the easiest right but like you know i think reason and just having some time to think about it especially since you know in the end like you you know it may not be your decision but like (laughs) um we try to make it so that it is it is their decision it is something that's there and i know from from my my perspective if if there's something that has to be done, like I'll do it and then pitch it to the designer, right? And um, that might be a lot of work. And luckily, the designer doesn't have to do that. <laughs> so true. It helps. Now, is there any one kind of instance where uh, you know one of the games you've worked on for us kind of came at you, and it just you know maybe it was kind of like you you literally just kind of pulled that one tiddlywink out and then it just kind of created this cascade of things behind it um was there anything that kind of went down like that oh man uh, so let's let's think about like specifics so <laughs> i <laughs> i think uh i think the games that i've worked on to to be as nice as possible have always been uh, there's always been a, some a vision for it, right? The designer mm-hmm. has a vision for it. So I haven't had a chance. I really, because I've been doing this for before this for about ten years, a designer, mm-hmm. I have never had the moment where I just really ruined it. Where I went, <laughs> oh, here we go. We'll try this rule out. Boom. Nope, does not work. <laughs> Done. We have ruined it. Let's go back a month. Uh, luckily, I haven't done that because, uh, like I said, like like you said, like once you've done it for a while. You're not mm-hmm. going to make, and since I'm making it, like trying to make it incrementally better, you're not going to make those decisions that are just like, throw it all off to the side. I've got this crazy idea. Come on, guys. Um, <laughs> I think, I think though, uh, the, the, the most I've had to do is take a, take a concept mm-hmm. and bring it to like an actual, like do a lot of game design work and bring it to, to reality. It's, it's a rare thing. And I'm, and I would be remiss to actually say which games do that. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to out a That's designer. Fine. But like, but at the same time, like there are, there are going to be times where I'm going to do a lot more work than than in other cases, just right. because there is an idea. And if that idea isn't represented perfectly, we gotta we gotta do a little bit going back to the drawing board. But yeah, luckily, no House of Cards tumbled yet. But <laughs> we still have time. There's still plenty of time. 
Um, what about like some of the things that, you know, as a, a developer, what would you want from your designers? Like if you could mold together the perfect designer to work with, aside from cloning yourself, let's be honest here. Um, what would that person be? Mm. You know, what, what, what were some qualities that designers should maybe have on deck when they come to the development process? I, I really liked, so my, the first designer that I worked with was uh, Chris Chung, mm. and that was with uh, Spell Smashers. Uh, and uh, working with him was great. And I think I got spoiled by him because, <laughs> <laughs> and this is not to say bad things about all the other designers. Everyone was great. Everyone was amazing. They were all easy. They all spoiled me. Uh, but no, but Chris nice Chung. Save. <laughs> uh, Chris Chung was was wonderful, uh, mainly because if I would come up with an idea, or we would come together and come up with like an idea, mm -hmm. I might play test it one day. But then he had his own group, and he was just willing to just make changes and do it right. And when you have that support and you can have that back and forth, you can really get uh, a game developed to a excellent point really quickly. And okay. There are times where I am just taking a, a thing to off to the side, and that's totally fine. Like I actually, in some cases, don't want to offend the designer if I have to make a large change. So give me that and just step away, and then I will just pitch you the cool idea. Uh, but in general, yeah, my perfect designer is someone that's like, yeah, that's a cool idea. All right, let me try this out. And they, I don't hear back from them for two days, and then all of a sudden they've already tested it before I can even do it. That's nice. pretty cool. Um, so in this current in the current environment, because, you know, as we record this, we're in the middle of, you know, the covid lockdown and all that. How is this kind of changing how the development process works for you? Uh, it's made it terrible. <laughs> well, I expect that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it has made it uh, very difficult to play test specifically. Uh, any of the designs. So mm -hmm. I have taken a more writer role, writer okay. editor role lately. So uh, a lot of the projects that I'm working on are either require a good amount of writing or require uh, scenarios or rules set up. So okay. a lot of that can be done with me solo playtest. Also, we worked on Warp's Edge too. So let's just work on a solo game. I honestly, if they would just give me five solo games to work on right now, I'd be perfectly fine. But, I have, I'd um, better be careful what you wish for because <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. But hey, if anybody, if anybody is sitting alone, hey, you know, you got you got solo games. You got Proven Grounds. You got Warp Edge coming out soon. You can have some nice solo games from Renegade to play. But that would be the the ideal. I was just playing solo games all day. But uh, I think in in general, it's a time for me to step back, write, do the things behind the scenes that I need to do. And then once we hopefully come out of this here, uh, I can get away from the digital side of things. Uh, if, if, right. if we go a little longer now, I'm going to have to start using Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator or uh, even Screen Tap, which we were using the other day. So, um, But it has slowed everything down for sure. Sure. Okay. I was just curious. And then obviously like the demand for the solo and the two player, because, you know, like oh, I just yeah. got, we just get, my wife and I just got stellar to the table the other day. Um, yeah. And fantastic. Love that. Um, and I can see where that's got to be a big challenge. So I was kind of curious how you felt about it. Well, cool. it's like, I know. And, and, and two stellar, two stellar too. I mean, that's one of those examples of I trust the the designers that, that I was working on. Like, that's Matt and Ben, and those are friends too. So, uh, having friends that you know are, are receptive to things, and then also knowing for a fact that Stellar's good because you've played it before, um, really helps. So maybe <laughs> maybe the perfect designer is actually a designer that plays all their games with me, and then I develop them. <laughs> right, and I think uh, we'll. Well, there was a there was a rather large, large alteration with Stellar, but I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna go into that because I think that needs to be saved for. Uh, we're actually doing a behind the scenes panel with Ben and uh, Matt, and it's I'll a have behind to the watch scenes. That. Yeah, behind the scenes of development, and it's uh, yeah. Feel free. Um, that should be coming up soon. 
And uh, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting conversation because that was uh, you want to talk about something that was X and is now Y. That's that's definitely it. I kind of want to see X now after playing it, but <laughs> that's besides the point. No, um, you don't need to see X. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. okay. You don't you, you don't ever have to see a Ben and Matt uh, prototype. <laughs> it's fine to just play the final game and be like, oh, this is how it's always been. It's not a Richard Lanius prototype. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> I don't know if anyone is even going to get that reference. But by the way, Richard Lanius is a great person and he makes amazing prototypes. Yeah. Designer of Arkham Horror. Absolutely fantastic. So That's what I hear. That's what I hear. <laughs> um, so is there any game out there that kind of, you know, would have a bigger fingerprint or a change that you kind of made that really kind of altered the game and how it ended up? Um, well, I think, what did we talk about? Man, uh, I think, oh yeah, so the uh, Terror Below. I think that's that's one okay. that I've had a, a big, a, the game was originally themed as something completely different and then had a lot just uh, uh, build up to make that uh, that uh, worm theme come out, worms in the desert. <laughs> and, and I think one of the biggest changes that I made to make that work was to trust that people are mean enough to each other that we don't have to worry about like randomness. They'll pay, they'll like, it was like, we will, they will choose to be mean. <laughs> <laughs> and and they will also choose to be nice in equal measure so that like you can actually have uh, originally i mean if you look at terror below as it is right now it's a game where uh, if, if you're familiar with it or not it's a game where you're out in the desert and you're trying to either hunt worms or collect their eggs and bring them to different locations on the board mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's got that b movie flavor to it right and so when you uh one of the things that was is in the game is these little target tokens that represented the worms okay those didn't exist in the original game and i think that was one of the biggest things was to say it is much more tense when there is actually a threat on the board and players are moving them around because when they were off the board or when they were just kind of like you fl flipped out a card and it came out at a random location or something like that or you had too much secret information off to the side just getting it so that it was more and more like oh this this little target that's where it's going to happen uh that increased the tension that is actually i think what makes the game work so uh so kudos to me <laughs> well i mean it, it also really plays into the theme because that that nondescript movie franchise b film uh, you know, was kind of based on that, right? Like luring them around, making noises and kind of driving them a little bit. And if you didn't have that element, yeah. I think it would really lose that that feel. Yeah, so. and it had a great, you know, and that's the thing, like being secretive about things, about moving those, those tokens around is great, but it's like, uh, it's so much more visceral when you know something's about to happen <laughs> um, and you just dread it, you know? <laughs> You just see it coming two turns and you're just like, come on, just get it over with. Just get it over with. Awesome. So the uh, the other thing I have is when when you're kind of designing like and taking games like Passing Through Petra, I think is a good example because, you know, we talked to Jay Alex about doing some of the, um, you know, he wanted to really do the tile pushing mechanism. Like that was a yeah. big driver for that game. So how do you kind of develop something that has, you know, to try and keep that vision alive, but then still be able to add other interesting parts that make everything just as interesting as pushing bits? Um, I think, I, again, I'm very lucky with like Jay Alex and Matt and Ben, because when I come in, I'm pretty much just going, we need to do a spit shine on this. We just need to do a real quick polish. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my, that works done. Uh, so I would say with with Alex's uh, Alex's game, the uh, the biggest thing that we talked about was just getting um, getting the right mix of special abilities. I think there was hmm. two or three of the little track uh, the different uh, caravans that you have on the board right. that changed during development, and I think hopefully for the better, but I think definitely for the better. And it had to do with uh, the idea of 
you have all these tiles that are coming out along a row and it was just always better to just have like everything match right right and it still is but it was just it was so much easier like there were certain ways that you could just manipulate it so you'd get this huge score and spin around the board a million times and then you'd be like i win um and to minimize that a little bit with some uh some side rules and pressure from taking different actions and being stuck on this little main action board i think was really key in in getting that game to fi- get that final spit shine and, and shine but i i love i love the pushing of the tiles um I'm surprised that uh, that I don't see more people doing that. Mm-hmm. But I guess with the fact that it's like actual tiles moving down a canyon, uh, a lot of companies are just worried about like having like a plastic piece or something like that. Right. But uh, man, on the table, it's great. It just it plays really nicely. I just love it. So the action selection system. I'm glad you brought that up because I really think it's it's very unique. It looks very open ended. It's just a three by three grid. And when you move your pawn towards a direction, you get to do the action that you're moving to. So you can never only do an action twice in a row. Now, you could very easily have done this many ways and things like that. So what made, like, you know, where did that kind of impetus for this little grid come from? Because I, I think it's ingenious. I think, I, you know, that's that's from Alex's brain. I love uh, it. But, like, but at the same time, like, getting him, uh, that was our biggest fight was... I was like, uh, when I first got the game and played it, I, I really enjoyed it. But like one of the things that we had a problem with was you you could go right and then left, left, and then right, right, and then left, left. And you never really had to go up and down. So you never, <laughs> you were never, you, you didn't really, if you found yourself in the corner, it didn't really matter too much because you could just move back and forth and it wasn't, um, it wasn't as tight, right? Okay. And I think now, now there are reasons to move up and down and you really like feel the pressure if you're taking a certain action. And I think that's the biggest thing, right? Just Mm -hmm. making sure that like, it's really cool when you can take two turns in a row of the same thing that you really wanted to do, but that's the limit. So it's like just, just enough feeling of like power to get two in a row, but you can't Mm -hmm. ever go further. And then once you get yourself in a corner, then you're like, you really do feel backed in a corner. You have to take two actions that you may not want to take, but you're in that corner. There's no way out, right? You're in a three by three grid and that's, <laughs> that's all you can do. So uh, that is that, that restriction. And I think most of, Al- so if I could, Alex Kevern's games, most of them relate to an abstract mechanic that is on the board that gives you a really tight decision space where you're going to have to maneuver around that to control the rest of the game. And he does this well in, in this game and in Artsy, right. uh, another another game from him uh, this year that, that I helped out with. I mean, again, very tight decision space. You're only placing one card. You're only getting one thing. And it's just, it explodes out from there. And um, uh, I think that that is, that's a really fun, fun aspect to see. I just make one decision and just watching the cascade of events that happen from that. Yeah, and it's funny because I just played uh, Succulent by him the other night. Oh and, yeah, yeah. And it, it almost to figure out. yeah, and it almost does. It it's the decision space starts out kind of tiny, gets big, and then if you're if you're playing to win, it gets small again. It's this weird yeah. kind of kind of dichotomy that kind of happens, and I think it's interesting wow. because it. It both accelerates to the end, and it still keeps it moving, and makes it makes you keep twisting how you think a little bit and setting things up, which I love. And that's the thing, you know. It's like those games, uh, Alex's games, are all about that that very tight. I'm going to do one or two things on my turn, right? Like there's a decision in succulent, right? It's a good example. There's two choices that's it you do one of those <laughs> things and then if you can you complete a contract um and uh once you do like that's cool you get like a little special ability and you might get something else that you can do for the next turn but every turn is like that do i do this do i do this when's the best timing to do this and then once you've chosen that action it just gives you other things to choose and nice little decisions and where am i going to place this tile yeah. where am i going to place this person and it gives you those little moments to feel clever, right? Like, because you can chain this, chain that, chain this, and you can kind of be like, ha ha. <laughs> I like those little <laughs> moments. They're fun. 
Yep. Everything has a, a tiny little engine element to it, right? Like not mm -hmm. a big part of it, but like in succulent, you have these little small crystals that you're collecting there in the game. Then all of a sudden you can just cash them in and you get the color that's related and you could have a huge turn just doing this. So yeah. Um, and then that, that space also goes away because that becomes your scoring later in the game. So what was very big, nice and available becomes tighter and tighter and tighter as you go on. That's, it's very, very clever. I, I really liked it. So you've also worked on two very large IP-based games. So, you know, you've spent time on Scott Pilgrim, and you also spent some time doing the Power Rangers game. So yep. how, how different is it working with IP? Like, do you have to, you know, go immerse yourself in the IP some to really kind of know the language? Or it's like, I don't know... Red looks like a good ranger to use for this thing. Like, like where? <laughs> like, I hope that's not like how people think that that works. That would be like the worst. That was like my best TC impression I think I could ever do. But... I think, uh, I maybe the yellow ranger should have the bow this time. I don't know. I I, I don't think know. that's totally oh, fair. No. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, no. Yeah, so you don't. Yeah, definitely don't do that. That's no. for sure, right? Like you got to have a, a relative knowledge of like the the, the source material. Um, I'm not going to take a ton of credit for for either of them. I think Jonathan Ying uh, is fantastic for for doing Power Rangers. He's an mm -hmm. inspiration for each of the different special abilities that are in that awesome. game because he takes such a, a small thing, and again, we're talking about small things. It just expands, but like just a very simple idea is a tie is tied to each ranger. And then each of those rangers, I mean, there's so many different universes and so many different seasons of Power Rangers. I could never keep track of that, but no. <laughs> he can. He yeah. can. And so every single character feels different. And that is just insane with only 10 cards and a special ability for each character to just get that much variance in that game. Uh, so I thought that was, that was, fan that was really cool. The uh, Scott Pilgrim, though, I got to be a little bit more hands-on with that one. Okay. And... And I think with Scott Pilgrim, I just fell in love with the, the the simplicity of the system, because I think a lot of times you'll play a miniature game, and there will be a ton of extra exceptions and rules you have to keep track of, and all these different things, just to like tell people basically, this guy hits this guy, <laughs> this guy moves over here. You know, it's like it's it's not. It's, it's really complex because it's like 3D. Well, I guess it's 2D, but it's technically 3D space. And it's really tough to tell people how that works. And this is really nice because not only is it on a grid, not only does it have all the characters that you know, they all, and not only do they do the things that you would expect, like Scott Pilgrim, uh, uh, it, uh, it, you know, uh, it does what you expect, but like Ramona has three different forms. Uh, as she changes her hair, which people who are familiar with it, like, no, oh yeah, she changes her hair and that changes her personality a bit. And then you have all the bosses that you know, and they all work in a way that makes sense thematically and mechanically. Okay. And uh, the, the cool thing about like working on any of these IPs is I haven't had to deal with the the, the, the problems behind the scenes. Okay. <laughs> I make a, I suggest or make a change and then they go pitch it to the IP people and say, is this fine? And then they come back and say yes or no. <laughs> okay. So luckily I haven't had to get involved because I'd be like, I'd be really heartbroken if like I had a cool idea and they had to shoot it down. But it's a lot easier if I have a cool idea and someone from the company shoots it down. Right. <laughs> Because, you know, there there's a lot more at work when you're working with the licensed property. It's not just, you know, yeah. it's anytime we use a licensed image, anytime we do that, it's uh, got to run it by them. Got to you, you want to put up a banner. You got to run it by them. It's it's really a, a completely different animal. And people are always like, oh, that game would be great if it was rethemed with X. And you're like. You know what that really takes? It takes, like, it's not just buying a license. That's it's certainly part of it, but it is such a two-way street. I can only imagine. Only but yeah, but I, but I do think it's fun, right? And I do think playing around in those worlds, like, it's been just awesome to have an opportunity to say, hey, I helped make these games. I made a Power Rangers game. I helped make a, I helped make a Scott Pilgrim game. Super cool. 
Awesome. Cool. So is there anything that's kind of coming up that you're excited about that you can kind of talk about or share anything like that maybe has your fingerprint for the rest of 2020? Jeez, I was going to say, I'll just, I, I, I don't, I constantly worry that I'm going to say something out loud that hasn't been announced. So I'm just going to say, hey, there was a Kickstarter for Scott Pilgrim last year, so that's going to be coming out, right? So I'll be there excited for that. And uh, Warp's Edge. Warp's Edge also had right. a Kickstarter, and that'll be coming out uh, later this year. And I have seen, that. the cool thing about that one is that I have seen behind the scenes on the, the special uh, extra tokens that you get from the Kickstarter, and just in general, the production of the game. And man, just the insert and how it comes apart and it's a solo game. So it's like, it's easy to set up. And that's all I want from a solo game. Just set it up so easy, yes. pull it out, boom, done, ready to go, shuffle the cards, we're good. You know, yeah, like none... as opposed to, mm, <sighs> yeah, I don't want to get into it. There's, I, I, like during this entire lockdown, I have not played any solo games because I, I just... I, I, I love Nemo's War. Nemo's War is great. Um, you know, when I was in the middle of the hurricane, when I was down in North Carolina last year, um, you know, I broke it out. But I also had it up for like three days where I could just kind of play it. Yeah, you could just play it. But, but there's something about setting, you know, taking all that time. I think that's probably like a huge barrier to entry for solo gaming for a lot of people. When it takes longer to set up than actually play, it's just not and cool. And that's the thing, you know, that's why like Warp's Edge, like, or even even uh, Proving Grounds too, the other the other in the solo series, right? Both mm -hmm. of them are very easy to set up and they're made specifically for a solo audience. And I think the reason why they're both like this and why they play in 30 to 45 minutes and um, all of those things is because of exactly what you said. Like, I'm just not gonna break it out. If I can play a video game, if I don't feel right. like, Again, to it's like maybe this is me. Maybe this is a secret, but I like to make the games a little harder <laughs> if they're solo games, just because I know I'm going to be playing it a lot. So like, right. I want to force myself to come back to it, right? So, <laughs> um, so there was a, 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 a people might know that like with Proving Grounds, there was a slight like misprint on one, some of the cards, and I actually. I like that better. <laughs> <laughs> you like it's like when you get taught the rules wrong and they're they're way harder than they actually game actually was. <laughs> yeah, so like I like those better. It's it's, it's 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 more fun to be challenged. So so yeah, and and it's also like you know it's like one of my one of my things like with solo games too. I like to lose real fast if I'm going to lose. Or okay. I like to have it come right down to the wire. So I think both Proven Grounds and Warp's Edge do that really well. Where you just I I just played Warp's Warp's Edge on like um, an electronic version, and and uh, <laughs> yeah, I just I've played this game a bunch of times. I just died first round. So <laughs> whatever, cool. So we do have Warp's Edge here actually being demoed on Tabletopia and people can go like sign in, check it out. And yep. and what we did was we set up like four games at one time. So like everybody can kind of run their own game at once and you can kind of all kind of see who does better, but it's still... No, uh, you should do it. If, if it's, gonna be, it's up there now, so just go do it. It's like, yeah. go play. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a blast, and that's just it. You can go log in, play, pull the rule book down. It's not that hard to learn. It's quick to set up, and it's pretty easy to learn. Yep. Even for a TC Petty game, it's easy to learn. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> that's true. Cool. So that's wow. That's so much stuff. And the, I think the only thing we we didn't even talk about was uh, Time Chase. Was the only game that that you kind of brought up that you hadn't done yet. So yeah, it's pretty uh, prolific. And, and, yeah, I, well, I mean, I'm not going to take any credit for any of these things. I think it's great that these designers came to Renegade with these ideas. Uh, I love that I've known most everybody that I've worked with beforehand, uh, just from doing the Unpub thing, going going to conventions. Which sure. again, it's like this is great that that Ren Renegade Con is here, but it. Kind of sucks that Renegade Con isn't somewhere else <laughs> where I could actually talk to everybody. I'd, li I'd like to be in San Diego that. right now, right? Like, I think that'd be, be a nice place to visit. That would, that would be great right now. <laughs> and you could come up, you could say hi to TC at the booth, and I'd say, hey, do you want to learn how to play Terra Below? And I would, 
and I then I would leave and let someone else do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this has been a blast. I've really enjoyed this. Is there any kind of last minute advice? Because maybe somebody's out there and they're like, oh, I could be a developer. That's easy. Like what? What would you suggest that they do if they they give really up, want to go? On, give up on your dreams. <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> there you go. No, well, for um, other companies, I, how about that? Yeah, for, for other. Okay, so for other companies. You want to be a Paul Inkow um, or something? That's fine. That's right. Uh, I would say if you're if you're looking to get into this, the best thing you can do is network. That's how I got into this. I started by going. I mean, I went to conventions, but I just ended up getting my first thing was working for Artana mm -hmm. and I just responded to a email list thing that I was sent I and I already knew Dirk from Artana from going to conventions so I'd already said hi and I was in you yeah. know and that's the same thing with uh, with working with Renegade it's just they hear about the fact that oh hey you're doing some development work I've got some development work that you're working on. So like I said, just get out there. I mean, I know it's hard right now. I know it's hard right sure. now, but the best thing you can do right now is be active on your favorite social media platform, maybe Instagram or Twitter, and uh, and just get people's people's attention. And if you are, have been in the industry long enough, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be good. Yeah, the, uh, the, the other thing I would add on to that is just be very clear with what you do because there's a lot of people and I can't tell you how many times somebody goes like, there's so many people, what do you do again? Like, you know. <laughs> we should have probably, we should have, we should have probably like started with that. Hey, TC, what do you do? Because <laughs> I think, I think honestly, like you hear game developer and you're like, I don't know what that means because game yeah. developer means something here and something this different. But hopefully from the introduction and if you're just like tuning in at the end here, uh, game developer is just someone that's going to help make your game better. I don't design the game. I just take the games that have been designed and I add that final polish that puts it out. And, right. So good. So that good. little je ne sais quoi. Right? Yeah. That little that, I don't that, know what. <laughs> when you look at the renegade, when you look at the renegade logo and there's a little twinkle on the side, that's me. That's the twinkle. I'm the twinkle. You're the twinkle. All right. I'll make sure it's there. Awesome. So thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to, to kind of tell us a little bit about what you do. I think it's really interesting for people to kind of see, you know, it's the same thing with like an artist and a graphic designer and a developer and a designer. Like there's a lot of relationships at work and a lot of ways people mm -hmm. can be involved in a game. That list of credits is long for a reason in a lot of cases, right? Yep, and everybody has their part to play, and a lot of people do multiple things. <laughs> yeah, so. that's what I'm learning for sure. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I'm going to let you go for the day, so thank you at home for watching. I hope this was awesome. Yep, thanks, um, everybody. Yeah, be sure to check okay. out the behind-the-scenes panel where you can kind of follow up on that Matt and Ben story. I'm pretty sure they're going to talk about it. Um, so I'd be curious to see what, what, what comes out of that. So. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good night, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. See ya.